Hello, folks, and welcome to Murder Hobo Incorporated. Tonight, we are delving into our Socium project. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Oddfish Games and uh, Pirate Dog Dice. If you need new math rocks, see, uh, hit us up at Pirate Dog Dice. If you want to write better and smell gooder, <laughs> especially if, you're game, if your gaming skills suck or stink. So uh, yeah, uh, check us out. We'll have the links uh, around on the graphic that you'll see around the screen. Uh, but you can follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter, take a look at our YouTube page. We have our past episodes in the archives. And the reason why I'm bringing that up, there is no recap this week, folks. So if you want to find out what happened last week, you got to check it out. So check us out on our YouTube archives. And uh, yeah, we have a total of four, <laughs> well, three esteemed and one rogue uh, DM here tonight for our Socium project. Tonight we'll be discussing uh, timeline and also major events in the countries that we've all developed uh, for this project. In case you're tuning in for the first time, Socium is uh, a world building exercise that we're doing. Uh, basically throughout this year, uh, throughout the year, we roughly meet like uh, at least twice, twice a month within this season to um, discuss and to uh, go over uh, countries that we have created on this global map. Everything's going to be compiled in, uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, Frank is uh, our illustrious uh, leader, is going to uh, compile all this together, all this info with maps and um, yeah, publish it and make it available through Philbar. So, uh, so without any further ado, I'm David. You can follow me on uh, Twitter. I'm under D and Devious. You might know me from the uh, Cacophony show that's on every other Thursday. I'm also part of the Calamity campaign, both A side and B side. A side, I play Ingve. B side, I play Crow, and in Cacophony, I am the illustrious uh, shape-shifting changeling Zadar. So, uh, gonna go ahead and introduce my colleagues here. We have Jeff, we have John, and we have Ian. So, if you guys, uh, re if you guys are ready to go, we're just gonna, I guess, jump into it because, uh, according to us, huh? Oh, yeah, and introduce yourself. So, well, I guess so what I'm really trying to figure out is which one of us is the rogue GM. Like, that's the real question. <laughs> that's one really of weird. us here <laughs> is a murderer. Uh, hi, I'm Ian, and I'll be representing Regions QNS. I'm still working on some socials for you to find me. It's probably a little tag there with one of my socials. Uh, also could find me on the other podcast that I am involved with, Wandering Monster, uh, in America's Test Table. Tonight or tomorrow, we're actually even doing a early preview of Melsonia Art Council's new Troika campaign or module, uh, the Runus Palace of Metagorgas. So that's going to be super cool. All right, John or Jeff, who wants to be next? Go ahead. Okay, which one of you, John or Jeff? <laughs> so I'm taking Jeff. Oh. So Jeff, you go. All right, I'm Jeff. Uh... I'm going to be doing the two regions, U and uh, G. Okay. And again, I'm David, and I'll be doing the regions Y and C. So, Mistra and Verdanya. I'm John. I'm doing J and H. And I don't have very much as far as social media to go look me up. So, if you're watching this, probably the only place you're going to see me online. <laughs> hey, you're in our one shots, man, at least for that. That's true. I do do so, the one shot sometimes. What's yeah. John saying is don't look for him, he'll find you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he knows where to find you. So, okay, well, let's uh let's begin uh with our zones. Um basically if you have names for them, I guess uh just kind of uh just give a brief description of uh, the zone, the area, and then just jump into right uh, your major event or your timeline. So uh, let's see. Uh, 
Jeff, do you want to kick it off? I guess so. So we're looking at the map right here. This is Paradise. Um, And so Paradise is a Paradise uh, slave country that sells mercenaries to uh, the rest of the countries. Um, The first major event, uh, Paradise used to be a a land of milk and honey with, you know, plentiful fruits and grass and uh, was ruled by uh, a queen um, whose name forsakes me right now. Um, Anyway, uh, since it was the envy of the country, it got attacked by uh, three kings and there was a big, huge battle, which uh, used a lot of magic and kind of destroyed the paradise. Um, so each of the cities, uh, you'll see Ethos, Logos, and Pythos, those are ruled by a, um, one of the king's descendants, um, the top king, as they call him, the sun king. And then they have since, uh, in history, referred to the queen as the night queen. So, and then we have this nice little place in the middle called Hallow, and That's typically, that is where archaeologists and historians think that's where the queen had her, her uh, palace. Um, There is now kind of a uh, Thunderdome where they do gladiators, um, steal people for the fights. And there's also some ruins around there too that uh, people can go and adventure into. So, and then the other timeline is they built this huge wall on the east side. Um, They kept getting uh, wayward uh, people from the other country coming into their land. So they built this wall to kind of separate them and be able to control uh, who comes in and out of their country. What type of naval involvement in there is there like let's say in the region of logos that prevents people from going from the wastes across that more shallow coastal region you know and bypassing the wall uh well the city itself are heavily guarded and then obviously they have like probably more troops than any other country since they're selling troops so that they could go into this shallower region but it's like It's desert, so it's like, you know, you're at your own risk of wandering around in the desert. But I'm sure, uh, and the cities are all heavily fortified and, you know, uh, with walls and stuff. So if you did get into into the land, it would be easier for them to be able to, uh, you know, stop you. The other thing, too, is, is, which I didn't mention, is... They use signals, so they have a lot of towers that use people with flags. So that's how they can relay messages between the cities. So if someone did come in, they would be able to signal the other cities to help bring troops to resolve the issue. When about did this giant cataclysm happen, out of curiosity? Um, That, I was going to kind of work with... uh, um, my brain died basically it's going to kind of correspond with uh the country next to it on the east um oh so that whole event's going to happen at the same because he had mentioned that uh, their countries are basically you know have ruins and part of those ruins i think is going to kind of go in with the uh, the war between the uh knight and sun king okay, so i need me- to like finite that timeline Okay, so Knight and Sun King, these are two or opposing Knight, factions? Yeah, Knight Queen, actually. Knight Queen oh. and Sun King. Oh, okay. Okay. All righty. And um, let's see, I'm trying to, trying to see. Uh, so basically you have uh, two naval uh, strongholds uh, at Ethos and Lagos. Is that correct? Uh, there's there's actually three. There's one up at the top too, Pathos. Oh, okay, Pathos. Okay. Yeah, and those are also training centers for, uh, you know, for their mercenaries and kind of the the names of the city kind of correspond to the type of troop as far as their 
like you know like uh, I think it's ethos is where you have a lot or emotion. So mm-hmm. a lot of their troops are going to kind of ha- use emotion and rage and where the other ones would be like heavily armored. Cause they're coming from a, from a force of authority. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. And uh, what about uh, it says eternal bliss, but you were, you were describing that as a waste pretty much. Is right. That that is, yeah, it's kind of an oxymoron as far as the name, because like right, you're in a right. desert and it's paradise, and then they called it, like, you know, back, way back in time, that probably was an eternal bliss, you know, with all these troops or, you know, plants and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, with them calling themselves the Sun King, you know, typically people think of Sun as being good as opposed to, and then the other queen was Night, so that's evil, you know, so mm-hmm. it's it's kind of take getting a play on that. They're trying to say that, oh yeah, we're the good guys, you know, whereas we're selling yeah. slaves. <laughs> nice, nice. But they have a good price, right? They do. I mean, <laughs> you can't hold them too bad against them. Occasionally, they do a twofer, you know. Mm-hmm. It, where do they um, get their slaves from again? I, I know you said this. Yeah, once. I'm kind of curious about that too, Jeff. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, now the three cities they do not condone on acquiring talent, but we have this little city hollow which has some people that are not so uh, nice, and then so they will steal people from other countries. Um, the other thing too is they just have huge breeding. So once they've got, they just have like it's a caste system. So once you have, you know, once you're set that you're producing babies, that's what your job is, and they're just pumping okay. out. Wow. You know, and then the ones that aren't good enough or don't make it into the cut, they kind of sell like as, you know, for gladiators or fodder for the gladiators to practice on. Yeah, it's kind of a brutal city. Cool. And, then they, <laughs> and then they'll also steal the ones from other because they're trying they'll use magic to be able to try to get resources, not resources, but like DNA from other species to help you know make their mercenary stronger and more kind powerful deep in the gene pool i guess dr moreau yeah right which is probably why they had to put the big wall because they kept farting around with the uh elephant people in buffalo wow <laughs> that is crazy okay um did you have another area that you wanted to discuss uh, tonight we Jeff? can we can let somebody else go, and then if we have time, we can go up to um, okay. Okay. G, which is car. Yeah. Uh, Ian, do you want to uh, go over uh, uh, what you got for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, so why don't we pop on over to Q, which is on the far west side. Huzzah! My lonely Q that awaits adorning. Uh, so for people who haven't had some of the other previous context of this area, this was subject to a global catastrophe that uh, the current working date would be 707. But in the uh, north, northeast, uh, there was a previously a volcano that had erupted that had devastated this waste, this whole island uh, destroying the previous civilization and blanking everything under a thick layer of ash, uh, leading to the creation of the Moors and um, putting a uh, a ecological um, challenge for plant and animal life to come back. So as far as the timeline for that, I'm still trying to workshop the name of the civilization that had lived here that had been wiped out. Um, part of the censorship of the name is also due to the rebellion of the goblinoids in the region of Kaizan, who were uh, enslaved by the peoples in this area. And they had uh, also uh, facilitated the uh, erasure of their legacy from history, leaving behind just uh, des- this, uh, desolate ruins of uh, various levels of intactness. So the history that I have, and I've missed some of the previous shows, so we can make sure that I'm not countermanding anything, but it sounds like the world itself had kind of gone through a global cataclysm or some geo, um, 
catastrophic changes in year zero. So if it is amenable to other people, my concept was to have a early race that had lived on the landmass that had comprised of that more than the island, because the island here is kind of fragmented, and so it's sunken by looking at the, the geomorphs. Um, but there was an early race that had perhaps triggered the cataclysm in year zero. Uh, there was a civilization that was divided in its politics and either had predicted a global catastrophe or had convorted with outsiders and summoned them, causing the showering of meteors and the uh, whatever catastrophe happened to the world. The civilization then uh, re began to rebuild itself and it had started its genesis around that north northeast to where there was a, a large volcano. My working concept is that a outsider had fallen to this area, causing a giant area of impact, wiping out the previous civilization, but then lay buried within the earth, kind of like a Chthonian creature or like lava uh, from um, Chrono Trigger. Early people began to worship this outsider to gain power, to rebuild the civilization, and then built a theocracy and cult-based government system from that. Uh, I have a timeline built up and I don't want to just kind of read it verbatim, but the general gist that I have, and I can go through some of these significant landmarks or uh, time marks, uh, everything kind of flavored within the context of the civilization would be year zero would be coming before the God incarnate, which is when the uh, earth was cleansed and their deity came to earth foundation of the temple in year 50. Uh, and then uh, once this temple, this early seat of government was created, then led to a diaspora, to the rebuilding of the civilization. So over years 51 to 200, the meadows bloom for the faithful, populating the, this, this uh, continent with various cities. Years 200 uh, to 330, the prosperity season and resurrection of the empire. Empire beginning to uh, grow and build um, and centralize its power, leading to a civil war and years of strife in 331 through 379. Um, and, you know, there's almost nothing as boring as a person that this tells you their entire character backstory in one go. So I'll just kind of leave it with that. Early, the first half of the timeline would be basically building up to a large empire that deals with the struggle of managing the distal cities, handling taxation, and struggling between a civic government, and then also the traditional theocracy, leading to a lot of infighting and political intrigue between the two factions. Um, questions, okay. comments, everyone's quiet on it. Is it still a theocracy now? Yes. So after uh, the government was moved from where this temple was, where the, the creature it was dormant for a long while, to a more central city where it became more civically minded, um, when the taxation started going more to the civic operations rather than more the temple, there was a assassination that was uh, sanctioned by the temple, wiping out all of the civic leaders and replacing them again with uh, temple leaders. Um, so from that, they, are, they were still in power, uh, leading to a lot of bloat and degeneracy and decadence that eventually led to its second downfall. Uh, the major thing that happened in year seven, like 707, was over time, uh, when, whenever you give a religious organization money, it begins to get corrupt. And over time, these church, these temple leaders saw themselves perhaps as superior or not needing the power of their previously worshipped God, abandoned the God, stopped worshipping it, and following uh, its age-old blood packs, God was pissed. The goblins that they had enslaved at one point uh, made a deal with the uh, the God, and um, that led to the God physically leaving the area, causing the giant volcanic explosion, destroying the island, and is now living somewhere dormant in the area of Kaizan. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Uh, uh, the in your timeline as it stands now, uh, how many civilizations are on the island in total? So after the year 707, the civilization was wiped out. So it's been mostly vacant since then. Oh, okay. Um, due to the spurning of the god, the, the people were basically completely obliterated with the exception of, I'm still workshopping it if I want there to be some type of uh, cultists that foresaw this cleansing and buried them, like hid themselves in dry underground vaults to survive the catastrophe. But have some of the survivors in more distal areas of the island becoming druids trying to atone for the devastation of the landmass and working to reforest and repopulate the landmass. But other than that, there's nothing that stands. The previous, um, everyone who wasn't already like obliterated in the volcanic explosion, um, like people that were just entombed in ash came back as ash zombies. So the islands in the very, especially the very center and the more areas are infested with uh, these ash zombie like creatures that come out at night and basically hunt anyone that is um, defiling the island with their presence. Nice. Okay. Um, uh, what about your other region? Do you have any more or anything like that or a timeline for the other? I do have stuff for S, but I can give someone else a turn. We can get back to that. Sure. Sure. Uh, John, how about you, sir? Okay. <clears throat> I guess go over to H, which is off in the far east. Almost there. Okay, yeah, that's it. It's humany. So, uh, humany um, was a region, or still is, pretty much a region of large plain areas, uh, lots of natural resources, pristine for many, many hundreds of years. The only creatures that lived here were centaurs and mutars from Tar. In fact, Tar pretty much controlled this whole half of the continent uh, up until about 200 years ago. Actually, did I look at 200 or 300? I think about 300 years ago. So about 300 years ago, um, a group of adventurers with a uh, mutar shaman slash mage accidentally opened a portal to another world and humans came out uh the humans uh you know they were nice at first they they were you know they basically you know try to get along more humans kept coming through the portal they didn't figure out a way to shut it down uh eventually the humans built a temple to their god of, in their home world, uh, who is uh, named Ig, and they bought they built this temple to Ig, uh, and eventually a city kind of arose around this temple. I think this is probably going to be this place will be down near the coastline, uh, yeah, near the river, somewhere on that area. I don't know which side yet. Doesn't really matter. I'll probably put it on the map at some point so we can get it drawn in. Um, eventually, this city uh, became a city known as Bastion. And uh, in this city, um, the humans in it became more and more uh, anti-human, anti other thing but human. Uh, they're, 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 they started worshiping uh, humanity itself, essentially, or at least what they thought Ig wanted humans to run it, run everything, and that anything else was inferior. Um, in my last time I was on here, I talked about how humanity was basically a bunch of human Nazis that hated all the other non-human races, and uh, they pushed they they pushed you know back on the creatures from Tar. Um, mainly the mut 
the Mutars got the worst of it because they got pushed, you know, almost to the edges of the grassland areas. And uh, a lot of them were essentially enslaved. They had a choice of either becoming servants of the humans or, you know, exile. The centaurs fought back more, but they too were, there was a big war, I guess, about, um, how many years ago was that? So I said at, at 250 years ago, the humans have several major towns and, uh, and fortresses set up. Uh, that, that was about 50 years after the portal opened. Um, and that's when they started moving out the Mutars. And about 200 years ago, there was a war with the Centaurs and the rest of the Tar nation that lived in the grassland areas. Um, and they kind of pushed them back to roughly where the edges of the grasslands are and the forest. Now they didn't, they didn't take over the forest. About 50 years ago, there were some big skirmishes in the forest area and humans have tried, you know, bringing in logging and stuff like that. That's had some problematic because I, apparently that forest has a connection to the Fey Wild. And so a lot of the times when they're logging, they get attacked by forest creatures or by the Fey themselves. Uh, so that they don't really control that whole forest, but they try to, you know, take advantage of the resources in it and they'll use that river to ship logs down to, uh, Bastion. Um, what else? Uh, I don't have a lot of other major events. I think about 50 years ago, there was, uh, what the Pope, the Pope's always Pope Gary. Pope Gary the Fourth, Pope Gary the Fifth, Pope whatever. Gary. Yeah, and uh, so the last Pope uh, became Pope after there was a big infestation of um, lycanthropes taking uh, control of different areas of the government, trying to overthrow the government of humanity that was controlled by the the priests of Ig. Uh, they were not very successful, but they, you know, they did manage to kill the Pope, but ultimately were defeated. So there's a new Pope now. Um, he has, he's, he's a little more lenient than the last Pope. So over the last 40 or so years that he's been Pope there, they have tentative peace with the nation of Tar. Unless Jeff wants to say that's not happening. <laughs> That's a, because Jeff's nation is tar and I want to hear more about what he wants uh, in the timeline but that's kind of how I was thinking but I thought it would be ironic that the humans came from some other world instead of a bunch of demons coming from another world it's the humans yeah, yeah that's a pretty stink. cool concept <laughs> I'm kind of working with something in my region uh, kind of in the same vein of that uh, Jeff what, what plans do you have for tar uh, in contrast to harmony and stuff like that, like you mentioned, I mean, did you have any idea what you're going to do? Um, yeah, we kind of talked about it with Humana. So basically, um, you know, they've been pushed back into the hills. Um, now the mountains, uh, where Rock Part and uh, Heart Mountain, this is actually predominantly goat tar so half goat half uh human or half okay. dwarf so and they're pretty much they kind of stay up there in the mountains but they you know they're kind of like a little bit irish so they'll come down for a good fight <laughs> there to help out um so basically they're just trying to keep what they have so far and not let humanity kind of push them any further over um I had uh, in the timeline for Tar, uh, two of the earliest events were basically fights with the fire giants. So they have up north this Mount Firehead. This whole little area was uh, fire giants. And the fire giants would come down and basically attack 
uh, Jubilee and Heart, you know, the cities and also the goat stars. And then in the middle, there's a citadel of eternal wisdom. This is where I was thinking that that was like basically a human, uh, huge city that also got attacked by the fire giants. And um, what I'm thinking is, is that the second time that the fire giants attacked, that's probably when a lot of those humans went west and kind of inhabited these areas. They just basically abandoned that area. Screw it, we're going to move. Um, but the fire giants were defeated. Um, and this is still kind of a ruin. So you'll have people come there. Um, there is lore of uh, uh, a man in the Silver Mountains. And these are the Silver Mountains. And there's silver in the Silver Mountains. That's one of the things that the Gotars mine for. Um, but people will go to try to travel to that and try to see if they can, if the you know man in the Silver Mountain is still you know alive or in there. So that's basically about it. I need to put dates on when those attacks were. Yeah, well, don't don't feel bad because <laughs> when we get to my nation, I I don't have anything, Mark. I I haven't been able to uh, to get uh, the. Uh, topography and uh, the uh, uh, points of cities and stuff like that on mine. So you guys are way far ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question for John. Uh, is the gates still open in that region? Uh, John, you're muted. Sorry. That is a good question. I'm not really sure if I thought about that, but um, they don't really need the gate. Uh, but I guess it would be interesting to know. Maybe if there's a big cover up where the gate has been closed, but no one knows yet. Like they're trying to keep it a hush hush. Oh, okay. Uh, or yeah. maybe there's just something wonky going on with it where <laughs> it's not going back to where they thought it went. You know, maybe it goes somewhere else now. I was gonna say where where did the humans come from? Was it Earth? It could have been. It could have just been some other world. I don't know. Really, I haven't made that part up. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah, could have been the Frank, Bronx. Frank says the Bronx. Oh, it could have been uh, Hell's Kitchen. Oh, I was just imagining that it's like a ward. It's like a wardrobe <laughs> somewhere in England, and like children. Hey, there you go. I yeah, like that's what it is. <laughs> I thought of that wardrobe thing too. Right. I was like, <laughs> that's going nice. to sound like. <laughs> you know, it, it could. It could be one of the things where that the gate itself is broken, but the church is saying that it's still valid and it's still powerful. But it's like a horrible secret that they could never open it again, even if they wanted to. And it's like the the fake Trump card that they're holding. Right. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. And maybe they're cut off from their God. And, and so some of the clerics have lost their power, or at least their high level stuff. Maybe, maybe if there were, there was a, a Pope that had the key that intentionally destroyed it or banned information. Like, I, you know, there, I don't know if there was a heretical Pope that was like, maybe other races aren't that bad. And they burned him to the stake and they lost a secret lore. I don't know. Well, the current Pope's a, he's very lenient compared to prior like he he upholds the law strictly speaking but he doesn't send uh like he's he's toned down the amount of anti-human activities Wait. that the church is involved in is a great deal. he a werewolf and eh, no one really no one's no you can't prove that <laughs> couldn't prove that right. would explain why they're trying to get rid of all the silver <laughs> that that would be a good tie into that. Yeah, that would be. That's awesome. Um, okay. Uh, I guess we can go over to uh, my neck of the woods, uh, back into area, I think, Y, I believe. That's what I have. Y, right across from, from Jeff's. So, okay. Basically, for uh, my region, basically extends uh, the length of the river to the um, 
across the the peninsula, I guess we can call this, uh, this marsh area and down here and uh, the the upper uh, border uh, is up towards the Dragon's Claw Mountains. Now, uh, the features of this place is very botanical, very tropical. And basically on the timeline of this right now, I have things broken up into different eras. And basically the first era is the, the dawn of the first era. And basically if, if you're familiar with uh, like elven lore and elven uh, pantheons for the elven gods, uh, basically uh, Corellin, when Corellin was, was injured by Lolth, whatever, blood spewed uh, from the side of Corellin and from the droplets, uh, the, the elven pantheon was created. So basically that's what this first era is uh, kind of derived from. Uh, basically uh, at the time when uh, the landmass was different a little bit, uh, before the first uh, calamity, uh, the, El the elven pantheon and um, the, the elven races that formed uh, from within that pantheon, they made a migration out of uh, the, the different parts of the multiverse. Uh, the elven race uh, didn't just extend to the material plane, it also extended to the fey realm and, uh, and other planes beyond. Uh, with the lore for my area was, is that uh, in fleeing with a conflict with some of the, the pantheon between Lolf and some of the other uh, elven gods, uh, the race of the Ladrin um, started a mass exodus from the, the Fey realm. And basically they were able to open into the material plane and the, the, the pathway that they opened uh, from the multiverse into the material plane, from the Fey realm into our world that we have here, they settled in this, this botanical region called Mistra. Uh, it's named after their, their leader, uh, Mistra, who, became, who becomes like the, ma the matriarch for the society that's gonna uh, be built here. Uh, they settle up in the, almost in the center of the Northern region. Uh, they established uh, a settlement and the settlement of, I wanna say over probably the course of, uh, I wanna say half a century uh, started to evolve. Uh, using fey magics as well as druidic practices uh, with the knowledge that they, that they had formed, uh, they were able to, uh, through architecture and uh, kind of uh, using the elements to help move some of the land masses, carve out this city. And the city is, uh, is going to be called Euphoria. And basically what Euphoria is, was gonna be like this Aladrin kind of utopian society. And uh, for, I wanna say at least two centuries within the, uh, this first era, uh, uh, there, there was uh, just this uh, time of, I wanna say like uh, peace and druidic bliss because as far as the Ladrin, they hadn't moved uh, into many other uh, realms of this, of this region. Uh, they were mostly uh, centered around the North and stuff like that. So basically they're, um, uh, they're the, the dominant race in that area until humans, which I'm gonna say probably made a migration from across the Bay of Ghosts to kind of flee <laughs> Jeff's slavers and stuff <laughs> like that, uh, were able to make their way over uh, to, to Mistra. And you start to have uh, an incursion of uh, the human race uh, into the lands of the Ladrin. Uh, the Ladrin with uh, contact with the humans and stuff like that, uh, 
uh, were kind of, um, I want to say, monitoring and uh, I want to say, kind of guide some most of uh, the uh, human race that was settling in this region uh, to uh, help kind of kind of integrate into uh, their society and also their, I want to say, um, I want to say, uh, I want to say ecology, using the, the land itself and its resources uh, with a little conservancy and sustainability. But of course, man, uh, the humans, they tend to drift away from, uh, I want to say, uh, a balanced ecosystem. And they started concentrating more on industry. And with this, the next era that would come out of this would be uh, an awakening, awakening of the elementals for this area due to the excess of industry and stuff like this caused the elementals uh, from the <clears throat> elemental planes or whatever to awaken to this region. And uh, the elementals started to, I wanna say, enforce their influence over this land itself. And uh, they were kind of becoming, I want to say, ingress aggressive and enraged and whatever to try to take control of the land to restore it back to balance. So basically, that's what I have with this era for now. So um, the more lore about this area is going to start to develop uh, as factions from the humans and those from the Aladrin are going to be carving out other settlements and things like that. Uh, basically, with one of the eras, there's going to be, I want to say, like a cultural awakening uh, with the humans in the Aladrin with the study of magic, both elemental, uh, I want to say also druidic, uh, and also focusing on more esoteric magic, uh, studying more into the arcane. Because one of the things with this uh, prim primal uh, elemental disturbance and stuff like this uh, is gonna come a time when they discover magical ley lines within the, this, this realm in this plane itself. And these esoteric magics are gonna tap into these ley, ley lines and later on, with the discovery of that in the search uh, for these, I wanna say like pools of arcane energy that, that permeate from the land, from the, la um, the landmarks, uh, the conflict's gonna arise between those that are geared to more balanced magics to where there's um, an, influence, uh, an influence of chaotic magic that's gonna form from that. So basically what we're dealing with with this region is uh, a very, I wanna say, fey influenced uh, society. And, um, and of course with uh, any fey influenced society because of the Ladrin's time in the fey realm, when other races uh, come in contact with, with it, there's always gonna be, I wanna say, some kind of disruption or something like that. And basically that's what this, this area in this region is gonna be built upon is uh, just on the fallout from that. And that's gonna come in a, like the second or third era. So uh, the chaotic magic is gonna start to, I wanna say pull and permeate around the Southern Peninsula. And I'm still trying to develop the story with that there, so, but. Whenever you guys have any questions, that's all the information I can blurt out at this time. So yeah. I'm sorry about all that. Whenever so. the elementals went on their rampage and there was, I guess, a whole era of this, uh, what did was was there like any kind of like increase in genasi within mm -hmm. the region? Uh, um, yes, that's that's what I was. 
I was going to allude to something like that to where more of a Genasi influence was going to, uh, presence was going to start to be established. So uh, I, I think uh, with, I want to say in D&D, uh, I want to say lore or whatever, Genasi are supposedly descended from Jen. So I didn't know if I wanted to work any kind of Jen influence it or just kind of have it as primal elemental uh, beings itself and not kind of uh, toe into the, the whole Genasi story just yet. So, but I mean, that could possibly come, come later. Uh, I just don't know how to incorporate Jen in, uh, Jen into it. Cause right now, cause what I'm thinking about is just more of raw elemental, like prime primeval, I guess, kind of things. So I'm looking forward to, uh, my frog people to the West if any of the industry or chaos magic starts encroaching on their territory to become eco-terrorists. That would be funny. And that would be cool. Straight up (laughs) nineties, like breakfast morning cartoon, you know, uh, battle toads or something like that. Yeah, Battle toads is a great exact. I was thinking about like Zen intergalactic ninja or like fern gully, but battle toads is right on point. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that would be cool. I'm really interested in to see what you can come up with with that. But like I said, um, mostly what I was focusing on was the the fey influence and the elemental influence of the land. Uh, one of the things that the land is so lush and it's uh, tropical that it's um, there's a lot of potential to make, I want to say, like a botanical type of uh, civilization and somehow incorporate it like that. Cities imagine like hanging gardens of Babylon and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, massive tiered ziggurats of just hanging gardens and things like that. So there's a couple cities that I have planned. I have uh, a plan uh, the the original settlement of Euphoria, there's going to be uh, Reverie, which is going to be in the northern part uh, by the river. And there's going to be a story behind that uh, that develops from a schism that forms within the civilization of Euphoria and later um, a migration towards the, the top of the narrowing of the peninsula. Uh, the city of Mistra, uh, Mystere, sorry, is going to form uh, right around there. And um, Mystere is going to be kind of, I want to say, their industry is the culmination of knowledge and arcane knowledge. And uh, there's going to be a, sci- a society kind of built around uh Academic, uh, I want to say academic uh, pursuits and cultivation of knowledge. Uh, there's going to be like a grand library. And uh, I want to say like uh, almost like a universal uh, university versity type uh, aspect to Mystere as well. So like I said, their, their main commodity is going to be knowledge because they're going to, I'm still working out a way to see how they culminate all that knowledge or whatever as a repository there in the steer. So anyway, that's what I got. So you didn't uh, think that those humans might, instead of escaping from slavery, embracing it and trying to take over that region? Just kidding. <laughs> hey, that is, I mean, that, that's a distinct possibility. That could be a source of the conflict. <laughs> so, between the Ladrin and the humans and stuff like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, I man. Mean, who wouldn't want somebody to do their laundry for them, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, Oh man. So, um, let's see. So
Yeah. <laughs> okay, what we can do is, um, let's see. Um, Ian, do you, what, can you give us kind of like a little preview of what you kind of have in mind? Not so much yeah, uh, sure. all the details. I know you're still flushing it out. I've got a, a timeline built out in our collective file. Um, so it is a little bit more bullet point heavy on region S compared to Q because as the people, the, the frog people for uh, the, the croaky, they have a strong tradition of oration. So their timeline is much more, you know, epic poems and ballads dealing with certain time eras. So each one has kind of a, a, a florid kind of title to it, dealing with the race, uh, um, birth of the race through development of the civilizations, um, high level information, timeline covers from their genesis around year zero, awakening with the uh, cataclysm of the world to uh, becoming one large populace, having the spore from that, the establishment of uh, other clans from that. Um, they started getting prophecy of a time of destruction coming, which eventually happened with the awakening of the worm, one of those Chthonian creatures that had fallen to the earth in the cataclysm. Uh, so that is where the genesis of where the giant megapede and uh, subsequent masses of other types of worm vernon that I've mentioned in previous shows. So I've got a cyclical history going of the rise and fall of worm cults that uh, rise. And previously, I kind of mentioned that I was looking at using those rivers as boundary lines to retain the megapede. But I think what might be an easy solution is the creation of glyphs uh so like rune stones that are used kind of like cairns in various areas that act as um, boundary lines to um keep the worm in complacent like in certain areas so those are focal points that come into skirmishes and battles uh, with uh, the uh, worm cultists um but you can take a look at that later if you want to collaborate offline to kind of figure out where some of these things may affect your territory Sure. Uh, since it's very much, a, I've done it in a vacuum, and we can make some um, cross pollination between our peoples and some events. Figure out for it is antagonism between the frog people and your uh, various races and forces in your area. Okay, all right. Well, that'll be good. That'll be interesting to see. Um, yeah, I think with. Uh, my area, I think, I think it could, yeah, we could come up with something good, uh, uh, potential conflict or, um, yeah, something can come out of that. I like the idea of, like you said, kind of like cairn stones or runes or something mm -hmm. like that to kind of act as what you're thinking is like wards or something. I think that could also work perhaps for the elementals to some degree or things doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they're going to be 100% perfect, but it may give an interesting conflict between the people and um, utilization of, of magic and crossover there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially with uh, my use of elementals and stuff like that, I can see something like that kind of uh, or, or going Perhaps a future alliance, because I'm imagining that it's, very difficult to flesh out or excuse me flush out the uh worm cult just due to the insidious nature um and that actually might be a force to kind of pull over some of the humans or that people are susceptible to the the dark dreaming kind of uh, in a um cthulhu-esque manner that this megapede exudes making more cultists so that's definitely a problem for both territories Okay. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about incorporating in, like I said, when the chaos magic uh, uh, influence starts kicking in and stuff like that, one of the things that I was going to have, I wanted to include, uh, since you were talking about like uh, dreaming darkly and things like that, uh, uh, Yugoloths mm -hmm. uh, as, as something along uh, that line towards uh, towards the the darker history of the region. 
So, I mean, there might be something that we can synergize with that or something. So. Absolutely. So that still gives us four minutes to do uh, our last territory. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's jump into that one. All right. That's area J. It's a little bit. There you go. You go. Yeah. Um, that name of that country is uh, Jubilor. Um, it's relatively new. Whenever the Wyvern Pass was forming, whenever it was formed, that's about the time the elves migrated to this area from other parts. Um, I figured they came from uh, Carol's uh, elven nation, but maybe not. <laughs> and because uh, I figured they were from somewhere far away from here. Uh, they came here, you know, roughly whenever that was created and the, uh, there were already, uh, lizard folk living on the swampy areas there. Um, for a while they had a few skirmishes with them. Then they made peace. There was, uh, it took about 30 years for the peace to happen. So probably what I figure happened was. Maybe some of the lizard folk had lived among the humans. I'm sorry, among the elves in one of the villages and and went back and educated, you know, and one of them maybe became the queen uh, somehow because of some. I was going to say there was a rise of the a threat of the Sahagan and maybe they uh, worked together with the elves to defeat them. There's okay. probably some ruins because I know Shar Churi has these ancient ruins. So I figure there's some within this area too. Maybe it attracts adventurers. I haven't really decided where exactly that's going to be. There is a city called, uh, God gosh, I forgot the name I wrote it down, but it, I don't remember the name of it now. It, it means something like freedom, but I don't really think that's the name of it. But it's down there by the bridge of Kai's. Uh, it's, it's on the, yeah, it's kind of near that mountain, more to the west, to the Western side of the mountain there. And there's a city going to be there. Um, all along the coasts are, are fishing villages on both the North and the Southern coasts. Um, a lot of these are just mixed races. Um, uh, that city, that's like a big, it's like a city state. Uh, I really want to detail the history of that, but I haven't got a chance to work on it too much, but it's, it's going to have a fairly long history, especially I need to get with, um, can't remember who did Kaizam, but we're, it's going to definitely be tied to that nation pretty closely. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in the, in the forestry area somewhere, there is a town called Jubal. Uh, well, it's, it's like an elven village, and it's it's got portals to the Fade Arc, uh, Feywild, and uh, also uh, it's like a treehouse uh, village because the elves, you know, and their trees, and these are mostly widows. Okay. Cool. I don't really have a lot. It's uh, you know, I don't have a lot of. I, I kind of wanted to go into what was there before, but I haven't thought that up yet. So I need oh, to think okay. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we all still have a lot that we're still fleshing out. So, sure. so yeah, you know, you'll have, you'll have time to, to suss out that, that storyline. So, but okay. Any questions? Uh, yeah, this, uh, um, this elven race and stuff like that, you said they migrated from like where, uh, part of Carol's region was or something. Like She's that? got, yeah, she has a, um, a region of elves up near the, yeah, up there. That's exactly. Oh, okay. And, uh, so I figure they came all the way down from there. Yeah, that's but pretty this long has migration. been maybe three hundred years ago. Whenever Wyvern passed, so they've been here a while. But for an elf, a lot of them probably still remember it. the old, the old. You know, they probably remember home. At least some of the older elves do. Okay, okay, and you said they're wood elf, roughly, right? Yeah. Oh, and the other thing is, this is 
kind of not really part of the history or anything, but because there's not that many people living in this nation, they have a lot of area to cover and defend. So they put a premium on uh, being part of the military. So if you want to be able to vote, you want to have a say in what goes on in the government, you have to have 10 years of military service. Okay. <laughs> before you can be a citizen. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Anything else uh, you wanted to cover, or uh, Jeff or Ian? Anything? Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, well good job, everyone. Yeah, I, I think I think we covered all that we uh, can for what we have for tonight's show. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how all this starts to flesh out, especially uh, with all the other regions and stuff like that. So I'm not quite sure what we'll have next. Okay, so okay. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm talking to Frank now, folks. So just in case you're wondering, it from what Frank told me, where it's going to be rivers, land features, and things like that that are probably going to uh, get discussed next. So anyway, well, that's it for the Socium Project tonight. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in, for checking us out. Uh, yeah, if you have any more questions or whatever, uh, I know you can reach me on Twitter under uh, Dean Devious if you have any uh, questions about my region, or uh, I'm sure you can always contact us, uh, you know, through email or anything like that, uh, through Murder Hobo, if you have any other questions, myself, Frank, whatever, we can get input to answer any questions that, that anybody who's, who's watching would have. Uh, that's interested in the Socium project. So, but uh, yeah, uh, we do have shows coming up uh, this week. Uh, Thursday, we have uh, the CRUD campaign, uh, which should be happening. Am I right, Frank? I know, I think, uh, <laughs> I was like, ah, suspense. Okay, we'll have the CRUD campaign campaign and then saturday we'll have calamity uh the b-side because one of the uh, of our crew is uh yeah a new father again so we'll so we're pretty excited for jesse for that so uh yeah <laughs> coda might not be present in the b-side but we're still running with that anyway so so i'm sure frank has something installed for us then so Anyway, folks, uh, follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter, take a look at our YouTube, uh, YouTube archives if you want to get caught up on any of our past episodes. Uh, we have merch. You can always buy merch uh, through our uh, merch store at uh, tinyurl uh, slash uh, RPG swag or something like that. So we have the link. We have the link or the info uh, within our template, so you can see it there. Uh, we have everything from t-shirts to koo uh, koozies. I uh, want to say uh, skateboards. We've got a skateboard deck available in that too. So it's just all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, it just helps, you know, keep the lights on here at Murder Robo and stuff like that. So. Uh, anyway, I'd uh, like to thank our sponsors, Oddfish Games, uh, for their Adventure Sense and their Shine system, which is a writing system uh, that we have. We, uh, I think we have word that they're going to be developing one specifically for RPG gaming. And uh, yeah, and also they had their Kickstarter that, that they finished, reached all their goals, and it's published, it's out now, uh, How to RPG with Your Cat. So you can check that out from our Oddfish Games too. Pirate Dog Dice, uh, if you want new uh, math rocks, uh, hopefully that rolled better than some of our, our players in our other campaigns, and uh, just contact them and they'll get you hook up, uh, hooked up with some dice. So, so anyway, thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests tonight. John, Jeff, and Ian for, for coming on and uh, just 
keeping us up to speed on these crazy ideas that we have for Sertium. So anyway, uh, let's do the big dating game kiss and wave and bye-bye folks. Right. We'll see ya. <laughs>